Welcome to another anterior pituitary tutorial. In this particular tutorial, we will be looking at growth hormone, which is secreted by the anterior pituitary. The functions of growth hormone include both direct and indirect effects on tissues. The direct effects include increasing blood glucose amounts and decreasing specific amino acids from the blood. The indirect effect includes the growth of bone, cartilage, and muscle through the production of somatomedins in the liver. To begin, we will start with drawing the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. So this is to illustrate the hypothalamus and the floor of the brain, and this is the pituitary. This will be the anterior portion, and this will be the posterior portion. There are three things that cause the release of hormones from the hypothalamus. The first is when blood glucose levels fall. The second is when certain amino acids increase. I'm going to abbreviate amino acids with AA. And the third thing is the presence of stress, which can be a psychological stress, an emotional, or a physical stress. All three of these cause the release of growth hormone, releasing hormone. We're going to abbreviate growth hormone, releasing hormone as big G, little h, big R, big H. So the hypothalamus detects changes away from homeostasis in the way of blood glucose levels, in the way of amino acids, and then also in light of stress experienced by the body. And the growth hormone, releasing hormone, is going to travel down through the blood vessel portal system to the anterior pituitary where it will elicit a response and cause the release of growth hormone, which will be abbreviated here as GH. Now growth hormone is going to have an effect on three different target tissues. It affects general cells, which I like to illustrate as a circle with a nucleus in the center. It also is going to target adipose cells, and I illustrate my adipose cell with the nucleus pushed to the border because the vacuoles of lipids have shoved the organelles of the cell to the periphery of the cell. And lastly, growth hormone is going to target the liver. Pardon my kindergarten art. So we're going to see effects across these three particular tissues that have receptors that are looking for and capable of binding to growth hormone as it circulates in the bloodstream. For the general cells, the very first thing that we're going to see is an increase in my amino acids, remember AA is amino acids, entering the cell. Once the amino acids are inside the cell, we are going to build new protein. In addition, we're going to prevent old protein breakdown. So those are the three effects that I will see with my general cells when growth hormone binds to the receptor on the surface of these cells. I'm going to see an increased amino acid entering the cell. I'm going to build new protein and I'm going to prevent old proteins from breaking down. This ultimately is going to have an effect to decrease certain amino acids circulating in the blood. to get us back to what we refer to as the homeostatic range. Anytime those amino acids are going to climb again, we can potentially trigger growth hormone, releasing hormone, and begin the cycle over again. 
Now the adipose cells are going to respond to growth hormone by undergoing lipolysis. This is going to cause the breakdown and the release of fatty acids. Those fatty acids ultimately are metabolized and will cause an increase in blood glucose. Anytime the blood glucose levels fall out of a homeostatic range, growth hormone may be released again to cause the adipose cells to again undergo lipolysis, ultimately resulting in more fatty acid production. Now the liver also is going to respond to growth hormone and it will do so by increasing glucose synthesis. The liver itself stores glucose in a complex molecule known as glycogen and the glycogen can be broken down and the smaller molecules of glucose can then be released into the bloodstream. In addition, the liver will also produce a hormone. So here's effect number one. Effect number two is the release of a hormone known as a somatomedin. And somatomedins are specifically going to target the somatic system, meaning that they will be ultimately responsible for the growth of bone muscle and cartilage. So here I'm having my indirect effect as somatomedins target my bone and my muscle and my cartilage. So as growth hormone affects the liver and causes glycogen to be broken down into glucose, and I synthesize this glucose, ultimately this is going to have an effect on my circulating blood glucose levels. It's important for us to recognize whether the hormones released in this particular feedback loop are protein or lipid base. As it turns out, growth hormone releasing hormone growth hormone itself and somatomedins are all protein-based amino acid derivative hormones. Now in light of our feedback loops, we also have the secretion of a hormone in the hypothalamus, which is growth hormone inhibiting hormone. And when blood glucose levels and certain amino acids change, blood glucose increases and amino acids decrease, we are going to cause the release of growth hormone, inhibiting hormone from the hypothalamus, which will effectively turn off the rest of our feedback loop. Pathologies can occur when growth hormone is out of whack, whether it's hyposecreted or hypersecreted. In the case of hyposecretion, we get stunted growth. Clinically, we refer to this as dwarfism, and there are two types of dwarfism. There is pituitary dwarfism and achondroplastic dwarfism. Pituitary dwarfism occurs when there is a tumor of sorts or when the pituitary itself doesn't secrete adequate amounts of growth hormone. These individuals are going to be shorter in stature, but the relative ratio of limb to torso length is the same as we would find in a non-affected individual. A chondroplastic dwarfism, which you may remember discussing when learning the, about bones, is a genetic disorder in which the torso and head are of relative anatomical size, but the arms and legs appear shorter. When we have hypersecretion, we're going to see accelerated growth. 
Clinically, we have two particular terms which we use to describe accelerated growth. These are dependent upon the age of the individual. With gigantism, we experience increases in bone length, and this is going to occur in an individual who has not gone through puberty. In an individual who is prepubescent, the epiphyseal plate is still loaded with chondrocytes, which are dividing and ultimately elongating the bone. Once puberty has occurred, testosterone, estrogens, and progesterones have a stimulatory effect on the epiphyseal plate to cause rapid growth. Yet at the same time, we replace those chondrocytes with osteocytes, and the epiphyseal plate ultimately becomes an epiphyseal line. Once the cartilage cells are gone at the epiphyseal line, the bones are no longer capable of elongation. At this point in time, if the pituitary tumor is still present, then we will see acromegalia, in which the bones increase in width or breadth. This is going to happen in an adult who has undergone puberty. In this particular case, we're going to see broadening of features like across the forehead. We're going to see an increase in mandible size and potentially increased diameters of both the hands and the feet. This completes the tutorial on growth hormone.